I'm excited this morning um, to share with you something that I feel like God has put on my heart, but also Mark told me what to say, so I just, I don't really have a choice, but I actually like it, I, I like it, uh, but it's just a blessing to, to just be with you, and um, if you don't know me, my name is Mandy, I'm the youth pastor here, and uh, if you see me running around with students, that's just, that's my life, and I love it, um, so let's jump right in, we're, we're, we're wrapping up our series called Defiant Joy, uh, we've been going through the book of Philippians, kind of looking at Paul um, and, his, and his letter to the Philippians, the people, uh, the church at Philippi. And we're just learning that from Paul in this letter that there's this joy that we can experience um, in God, in Jesus, that, is, that can actually defy the circumstances, the pain that we go through. Um, it, it can just, it can precede all of those things and we can actually have joy in the midst of our struggles. And Paul gives us such a cool picture of that. Um, and today we're going to continue that and we're going to wrap up this series. We're done. Uh, we're in chapter 4, verses 10 through 20. So we're wrapping up uh, Philippians. And we're going to be looking um, at this, this passage where Paul says that he has found the secret to contentment. And I don't know about you, but if there's like a place in the Bible where I'm like, what is like the best or one of the best things that you can learn I think for people, uh, especially in our culture, and, uh, you know, as, as American people, like the best place I think uh, is, is one of the best places is right here where we learn the secret of being content. Um, and, and we're going to jump into that uh, today, and I'm excited for that. And um, if you've been with us the last few weeks, we've been practicing this, uh, this, this thing together called scripture reading. We've been standing together um, in honor of God's word and just reading the passage uh, that he wants us to learn from today. So could we do that real quick? Uh, would you stand with me as we read our key scripture this morning? Like I said, it is uh, Philippians chapter 4, verses 10 through 20. Paul says, I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you have renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you have been concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I'm not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any, in every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living um, in plenty or want. I can do everything through him who gives me strength. Yet it was good for you to share in my troubles. Moreover, as you Philippians know, in the early days of your acquaintance with the gospel, I set out from Macedonia, and not one church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving except you only. For even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent aid again and again when I was in need. Not that I am looking for a gift, but I am looking for what may be credited to your account. I have received full payment and even more. I am amply supplied, and I am amply supplied now that I have received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent. They are a fragrant offering, acceptable and pleasing to God. And my God will meet all your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father be the glory forever and ever. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. You may be seated. Like I said before, we're, we're going to be digging into this, this passage, mainly in the beginning where Paul, because he's kind of thanking uh, the Philippians for, for their gift to him. They sent Epaphroditus and sent aid, but you can see there that there was a time where Paul didn't receive anything from them, and he's just clarifying that he's glad that they're back in a relationship where they're connecting. Uh, at this point, Paul's kind of imprisoned by the Romans, and uh, I'm sure that the, the way of communicating between uh, him and his friends and, and the church was probably, probably difficult at times. Um, so he is just expressing here right in the beginning that he is so glad that they're connected again, that they're serving one another, giving and receiving from one another again. But we're going to be digging into this, this, this portion, um, and, and it's him clarifying that their relationship is not based on, hey, I just want you to give me money. I want you to give me what I need, but their relationship is actually based on much more than that. Um, and to kind of rebuttal maybe uh, some of the feelings of people, he gives us this amazing little passage um, that I want to dig in with you where he says, I've learned the secret of contentment. I don't need what you have to give me. Uh, like I, I accept it and I, I think that it's amazing and it's, it's what we do as, as uh, fellow Christians and believers in Jesus, but I'm, I'm actually content and I've learned the secret of contentment. And he says, in any and every situation, uh, what seems kind of like, to me, kind of arrogant, like, okay, like, Paul, seriously, like in everything, 
But he teaches us something here that I think we could grab hold of today and walk away with um, encouraged. Um, one thing, if, if you know me and, and you've heard me speak before, one thing that's really important to me, especially for our students, is that um, they understand that they're not alone in their problems, in their situations, in their, their good and bad habits. Um, it's really important to me that our students know and that people know that when I'm friends with them, especially because a lot of my friends uh, are in a ministry and they're like, well, my, my good friend Manny, he's a pastor. And I never want them to feel like when I come in contact with them or I'm talking to them or encouraging them uh, that they're alone in their, in their situation. So a, a lot of the times if you hear me speak, I, I actually try to kind of level the playing field. Although I'm standing on a platform right now, I truly believe that we're just, we're just people. And God is working on us. We're all on a journey with Jesus. That's what one of the pastors that I'm close to, he says, we're all on a journey with Jesus. And not one of us is better than the other. And this morning as I talk about contentment, I just want to be honest with you. Can I be honest and vulnerable with you for a moment? This is probably the hardest area of my life that I, that I struggle in. It's probably the area where I wish that I, was a, I, I had a little bit more balance in my life. That I wish I had a little bit more um, uh, uh, contentment in my life. Uh, to be honest with you, one of my deepest desires is that I would be satisfied and my needs would be taken care of and then I would be content. Uh, you know, some of that's just my nature as, as, a, as a human being. Other than that, uh, some of the other stuff is just because I grew up with, with not much. So there's, this, there's sometimes a fear in me that, that, I won't, that I won't be content, that I won't find anything that kind of makes me feel satisfied. And I want to show you something that has helped me kind of, um, uh, kind of understand this. It's called the Enneagram. Um, and when I say that, if you know, you know. You know what I'm saying? Like some people are like obsessed with the Enneagram. If you don't know what that is, it is basically a personality assessment that helps you kind of determine where you fall on these nine different personality types. It's not meant to box you in. It's actually meant to help you be self-aware, but also in, in business and in the workplace, they use it so that you know who you're working with and how they kind of function and work. Um, not everything on your Enneagram when you take it is gonna be completely accurate. Unfortunately for me, mine is like spot on. Like I don't think there's any like fallacy in it. There's like everything's right on. Um, if you take the track here, the four square track, you'll actually take this assessment along with some others. It's really helpful. And I wanna kind of show you my chart. Can I, can I do that? You guys can kind of chuckle with me here. Uh, so I am an Enneagram number seven. Everybody say seven. So um, there's a lot of names that they kind of title these. You're like, you're, you're number one, you're a perfectionist, or you're number two, you're a helper. Well, then, and title for mine is the enthusiast or the visionary. Uh, the busy, variety-seeking type, spontaneous, versatile, acquisitive, and scattered. You can go on to the next slide. Here's a little uh, summary of what it means to be a seven. Um, like I said, not everything is spot on, but it says sevens are extroverted, optimistic, versatile, and spontaneous. Playful, high-spirited, and practical. I don't think that one's so true for me. I'm not that practical. They can also misapply their many talents, becoming overextended, scattered, and undisciplined. They constantly seek new and exciting experiences, but can become distracted and exhausted by staying on the go. They typically have problems with impatience, impulsiveness, but at their best, they focus their talents on worthwhile goals, becoming appreciative joyous and content at their best. Next slide. Seven's basic fear is being deprived and in pain. And their basic desire is to be satisfied and content to have their needs fulfilled. And there's this last slide about sevens. Key motivations, sevens wanna maintain their freedom and happiness to avoid missing out on worthwhile experiences, little FOMO there and to keep themselves excited and occupied and avoid and discharge pain. When moving in the direction of stress, scattered sevens suddenly become perfectionistic and critical. However, when moving in the direction of growth, gluttonous scattered sevens become more focused, content, and fascinated by life. This is my personality type. This is, uh, when I say contentment is, is a struggle, when Mark gave me this, this message, I was like, ah, I don't know, because I'm not really content with that right there. I'm not, I'm not really content with what you gave me. So, um, you know, and, and there's been moments where me and Mark sit in his office and um, I'm asking for things, I'm asking for more. Um, and he's like, well, well what, isn't what you have just like kind of enough? 
And, and that, that question just bothers me. So when I say that this morning, we're learning together, it's truly like we're learning together. I've studied this passage and um, just asked God to kind of help me this week find a place of contentment. And um, as I was thinking of it, anybody a, a, a visionary person, like you like to see things to like kind of visualize it. You a visual person, anybody in the room? So am I. So I was trying to visualize what it looks like for me and, and a lot of people to find contentment. Um, and this is kind of a little diagram that I made. Uh, it kind of looks like this to me. There's this place where I'm here right now and there's this vast gap uh, to where I am content. And in between there might be a variety of different things, but it could be one thing. Um, and for me, like, I mean, it's been, a, like I said, a variety of different things, but maybe for you, it's, it's more money you can flip for, to the next slide. Uh, maybe it's like you're here right now, I and mean, this is where you are, but if you had more money, uh, that's where you'd be more content. Like if you just had more money, or, or the next one is, maybe if you had a relationship, like if you're kind of lonely and you, you think, I'm here right now, but if only I had just a relationship, then, then I'd be content. Or the next one, maybe it's just more time. Maybe you feel like you're just busy. If, if my wife was here right now, she would say, well, we have three kids under three. They're all girls, they're sassy, and they cry, and they're beautiful, and when they smile at you, you feel like you have to give them what they want, you know what I mean? And, and it seems like sometimes we just need more time, and if I just had more time to spend with God, or if I just had more time to myself, then I'd be content. If I just had time without the kids, then I'd be content. It kind of sounds right, or maybe it's a better marriage. Maybe you're, you're here right now, and your marriage is struggling. If you just like, if I just had a better marriage, if, if my wife was blank, or if my husband was blank, then, then I'd be content. Or if none of those, you know, rely on, <laughs> relate to you, there you go, fill in the blank, whatever that is. I think this is a lot of the times what we look at when we, when we think about contentment, when we think about us being satisfied, there's always something in that blank that will give us that, and a lot of these things are just momentary. And usually what happens is, is like, I think it's like one of two things, um, and they both kind of end up in the, same, in the same way, is that we can go chase whatever that is that we think will fill our life. We can go chase that, and we can try to fill in this blank and try to become content, um, and then one of two things happens. You either get it, and you're like, okay, like, you know, I want more money, so I go out and I strive and I get more money. Or you try and you strive and you don't. And both things are, are crushing to you because you finally get to the place where you think you'll be content and it's not enough. And then you start to get critical or you start to try to try more. I want more of this. I want more of that because this is just not enough for me. And I've been here before. Or you fall short. And I've also done that, where you try, you know, you strive for this, you strive for that, and you fall short, and you also become critical, or God's not, he doesn't care. Well, he doesn't understand my needs. Or I've said this before, I'll be vulnerable with you. Well, my wife just doesn't, she doesn't know what I need. And like, it's on her. Or, or my kids, blah, 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 blah. And I try to, I, try, I get critical, and I get upset because I'm trying to fill a gap with something that is only going to provide me temporary, if that, satisfaction for my heart. And like I was saying earlier, there's, there is a desire in us that, like Grace said, there is a desire that we have, this, this need that we have in our hearts as people to be satisfied. And, and often this is where we end up, striving. And Paul says this to the Philippians. He says, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or want. I can do all things through him who gives me strength. And, and as I read Paul, I've, I've learned through this series that Paul is just, he's speaking from experience. I just love that about his writing. I, I think that he's not giving like self-help advice. He's not saying something that he doesn't do himself. He's actually speaking from an experience that he's had in his life and, and, and hope and joy that he's found in Jesus. And I think that today, I just wanna learn from Paul's life with you where he found the secret of content. Does anybody else wanna find that? Am I the only person in the room that's like, man, I wanna find that secret. And I think that we can find that in Paul's life. And I wanna give you just a little bit of Paul's life. It's, it's actually just in four or five verses here where he kind of explains his life. 
Um, and I don't know about you, but I wouldn't sign up for it. I know Paul sounds like a great guy, and, you know, it seems like God just, you know, he had the best life ever. But here in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, he summarizes some of the sufferings that he endured on the journey with Jesus. Um, and I'm, I'm going to highlight this for you, and I want to kind of explore what he finds here in the midst of all these, these sufferings. He finds this truth about the secret of contentment. Um, and, and I can't wait to, to just read this, this list of sufferings because it's, it's, it's crazy. He says this, five different times the Jewish leaders gave me 39 lashes. And when we're talking about lashes, we're talking about the same lashes that Jesus got. Uh, we're talking like, like whips that have glass and metal and shards that, you know, once they get a hold of you, they're, they're, they're doing damage. So that's five times, 39 lashes. Three times he was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned, I mean, he's talking about it casually, like once I was stoned, um, you know, like with rocks. Um, three times I was shipwrecked. Once I spent a whole night and a day adrift at sea. I have traveled on many long journeys. I have faced dangers from rivers and from robbers. I have faced danger from my own people, the Jews, as well as from the Gentiles. I have faced danger in the cities, in the deserts, on the seas. I have faced danger from men who claim to be believers but are not. I have worked hard and long and during many sleepless nights. I have been hungry and thirsty and often gone without food. I have shivered in the cold without enough clothing to keep me warm. Then besides all this, I have the daily burden of my concern for all the churches. What a life. Like, I mean, this is his words. He writes this. Like, it's like, he's like, I go through all this stuff and on top of that, I'm stressed out a little bit about my job, too, because I got these churches. I want to care for them. And right in the next chapter, I mean, it just gets better. Right in the next chapter, he, he says uh, he has this thorn in his flesh. In his words, he says uh, something that torments me, uh, something from Satan or from hell that torments me. Um, and, and he says, I'm tormented. And I, I pleaded, this is what he says, three different times I begged the Lord to take it away. And each time he said, my grace is all you need. Can we say it together? Say, my grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. This is what Paul says. He has all these insane, I mean, he's getting stoned, he's getting beaten with rods, he's getting five times 39 lashes. I don't know the math on that, but that's a lot of lashes. He, he's, getting, he's getting tormented. We don't know if it's mentally, physically, or emotionally. This thorn in his flesh, we don't, we don't know. Some scholars have, have, have guessed or try to get context clues from his life of what this is. But he, Paul has a difficult life, am I right? Anybody agree? Like, that's, nobody would say, you know what? Like, that's the kind of life I want. Like, oh, yeah. Paul was amazing. Like, he was one of the most well-known apostles uh, in the world. I mean, he, he, his life just speaks to today. Nobody would choose that life. And, and I think that we, we see this in Paul's, his whole, like, writings, not only in Philippians, but in all of them, that there is this peace that this guy has that is just kind of confusing. And I talked about it a couple weeks ago, how some of that joy was from him fixing his eyes on Jesus. But, I, I mean, you can fix your eyes on Jesus and you can, you can spend time in his presence, but it still sometimes not feel like enough because of the situations and the circumstances that you go through. And if I was Paul, to be honest with you, and this was the kind of life that I was experiencing, I think contentment would have just been at least, God, can I not get beaten up anymore? Can, can you save me maybe five lashes? I'd be fine with that, God. Just five. Just take five off the top and I'm good with the rest. Or maybe, God, maybe just... Everything else is fine, but just not the torment, because that's just hard for me. Or God, maybe you just make all the churches really healthy and, and just make it all right. And, and maybe, maybe Paul struggled with that, like what is filling in the gap there? But he comes to this, this realization in, in both this Corinthians passage and the Philippians passage. Uh, he says, I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation. So this is, he writes Philippians after Corinthians. So this, all the suffering that he wrote is even before he's in prison again by the Romans. So this is later on he writes in Philippians. He says, I've, I've learned to be content through all those situations. Whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or want, I can do all things through him who gives me strength. So we know Paul's not joking around when he says, I've learned to be content in every 
circumstances because the dude went through some stuff. Am I right? Like he went through a lot. And he says the secret of being content is right in verse 13. It's, it's, the, it's the one that the athletes put on their eye black when they go out on the field. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. The secret is that Paul knew that Christ would give him strength through the midst of the circumstance. It almost seems like, well, that's not really a secret. Well, it is when you're going through all of that. There is a secret there that there's a trust in God, there's a faith in God, there's a relationship element with Jesus that Paul has that even in the midst of the most difficult, painful, the most suffering that he could endure, he found this secret that he could rely on Jesus. But the question is, how did he get there in the first place? How did he get to the place where he could actually trust that he could do all things through Christ? who gave, gave, gave him strength. And I think that answer lies right in that, that Corinthians passage uh, it, it, where he says, uh, can you put on uh, 2 Corinthians 12? I think the answer lies right here. I begged the Lord to take it away each time he said, my grace is all that you need. My power works best in weakness. There's this secret that lies in Paul's life, and there's this beauty and this theme that wraps around all of his writings. It's that he goes through all these painful situations. He goes through all these difficulties for God. There, there seems like there's no thing in his life that would bring him just a little bit of satisfaction. But he finds it when he's begging and he's saying, God, I can't take this anymore. God, take it away. I just want something to kind of make me feel at ease, to make me feel satisfied. I feel like everything in my life is just kind of tormenting me. It's kind of hard. It's kind of difficult. It's kind of like, it's not the life that you think of when you start following Jesus. And God's answer to him is not like, oh, Paul, I'm so sorry. Like, I'm so sorry. Let me, let me just take away some of the pain. Let me just take away some of the hard circumstances. Let me just take away the hard life that you're experiencing. His answer is that what? His what? Grace. His grace is sufficient for Paul. And, and as I read this, I'm like, I, if I was probably like, you gotta be kidding me, God. Like, is it really enough? My question to you is, is Jesus really enough? for us? Is he really enough for us? Or has Jesus been a part, a sliver, a portion of the contentment that we experience? When, when Jesus doesn't become enough, do we move to something else to finish the job? Do we keep on turning back to that because there's this dissatisfaction in our hearts or, or is it is that we chase, we chase the wrong things and we, we get this temporary satisfaction then we fall to Jesus and we say, you know what, God, I, I just, I need something. Is Jesus more of a fix or is he our contentment? I, I learned through Paul's life that this is so true for, for people, for me, for you, is that we can experience the joy and contentment when we center our lives on God's sufficient grace for us. In, in Paul's life, you see this theme where it's like his life is horrible on the outside, but there's this undercurrent in his life that is keeping him content, joyful, hopeful in all circumstances. Like, I don't know how that's possible, but then you see him beg to God and you realize, okay, Paul's human like me, and he's begging for the situation to change because he's struggling. And you see that Paul says something, uh, something to God that says, you know, God, I'm, I'm struggling. And God says something back to him. He says, my grace is sufficient. Look, Paul, if you, if you just trust in my grace, if you center that in your life, if you rely on that grace, it will give you strength. I think that is the verse that helped Paul write the next one that says, you know what? I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. What is giving him strength? It's the grace of God. It's God's grace that is strengthening Paul through the circumstances, through the torment, through the thorn in his flesh, through the, through the seasons where he doesn't feel content, through the seasons where he's struggling, and it's the same for us. 
We can experience this defiant joy and this contentment that we want and we need for our hearts. We, we don't have to feel bad because we're in need. We have to center it on the right thing. It's God's grace for our lives, in our lives, working in our lives. You might say, what is that? What is that for Paul? How was God kind to Paul? How was he favorable to Paul? Because that's what that word grace means. It's charis in Greek. It means kindness or favorable or favored. If somebody was to treat you with charis, they were being, they were being kind to you. They were showing you this undeserved um, kindness and favor. It's that word charis. How, how, was, how was God showing favor to Paul? How was he, how was he um, showing kindness to Paul when Paul's life was difficult? And I think this is something for us to kind of listen to today and grab a hold of. God's grace and kindness towards us does not equal an easy life. That's not what that means. I think we think of God sometimes that way. Well, if God is this, then he should do this for me. I've heard students say that, well, if God is so good, then why am I going through this? But God's grace is not based on making your life easy. It's not based on making Paul's journey more easy. It's not that God's grace was like, okay, Paul, now your grit, my kindness to you is that you are free from all the trouble and the situations that you're going through. God's grace for us and God's grace for Paul is the person of Jesus in our lives. And that's what Paul discovered. This is the secret, friends, that I found this week as I was studying this, is that the secret to the longing of my heart is not a thing, it's a person. And the person is Jesus. And that for me is so deep and it sinks so deep into my heart because you have to notice that I don't have to go work for that. I don't have to go chase the contentment. I can rest in it. Or in other words, I can rest in him who is my source. His name is Jesus. And you might say, when did Jesus begin to be kind to you and I or begin to be kind to Paul? It's when Jesus decided that he was gonna take off glory, humble himself, come to earth and die for every single human being to extinguish extinguish the power of, of hell, sin, death on himself and take that so that we can experience life. God's grace for us was made flesh in Jesus. He is the chorus of God and he came to show us favor and kindness that wasn't deserved by coming into the world and taking the punishment that we deserve. And Paul, he came to this, this realization that that alone, right there, was enough. And my question is, is that enough for us this morning? Is that enough for us when we're going through the fire? Is that enough for us when we're struggling and we're having terrible time or somebody in our family is sick or we're sick and it just says, well, 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 maybe if I just had this, I would be content, God. Well, just answer this for me. And God's answer to us is, my grace is actually sufficient, sufficient for you. And my power works best when you understand that you are weak and you have to rely on me and send your life on me. I think I, I drew another diagram I think this is what true contentment looks like for our lives. It's not a journey where we have to go chase something or fill in the blank with whatever that is, but it's actually a repositioning of the grace of God Jesus in our life. And from that place springs joy, springs contentment even in the midst of trials and tribulations. From this place when we center ourselves on Jesus, we begin to understand that there is something much more in God's grace and love for us than an easy life. There's actually a person that is willing to walk with us the entire way. That's the secret of contentment is that God's grace is sufficient for us. Dallas Willard says this. I think this is a beautiful quote. He says, a carefully cultivated heart will, assisted by the grace of God, foresee, forestall, or transform most of the painful situations which others stand like helpless children saying why. A carefully cultivated heart, a life where we center ourselves 
and position the grace of God at the center of our life, and we reposition Jesus at the center of our life, a carefully cultivated heart, assisted by God's grace, assisted by Jesus and the love of God in our life, assisted by that, meaning when we're going through the trials, we have to remind ourselves that God's grace is sufficient, that Jesus is enough for us, that his love is enough, that what he's done for us is enough. And it's worth it to keep pressing on because Jesus paid it all for us. A carefully cultivated heart, assisted by God's good grace, will foresee, forestall, and transform most of the painful situations in our life because we know that Jesus is enough for us, that he's there for us, that he's never left us. We can rest in that. We can experience the joy and contentment when we center our lives on God's sufficient grace for us. Like I said, when we chase to fill in that blank where we feel empty with whatever it is we fill it with, we end up getting what we want and it not being enough, or we fall short and we're left wanting all the more. And the sad part of that is that we, in both scenarios, are left bitter and like critics. And if you notice, uh, part of my personality type is when things aren't going quite my way or I get stressed out, I become a perfectionist in the worst sense, and I begin to become critical of the world around me and even my situations and most commonly, to be honest with you, God. There, there comes a moment where I feel like I'm so empty and there's nothing filling it and I've been trying. And I'm like, God, I'm trying to do it. I'm, I'm trying to pray more. I'm trying to, to be in your presence more, God. I'm trying. And it seems like God's answer is, it's not trying. It's resting in me. And when we try to fill that blank and, and we come short or we even get it and it's not enough, we become critical. Maybe you've said this before. Well, I, I can't believe God would let this happen to me. Why, why do I feel this way? I thought God was going to blank. And God's answer to us is, is not making our life more easy. It's actually him offering us a choice to put him at the center of our lives. Is Jesus enough for us today? Is he enough for me? I've asked myself a lot this week that question. Can I tell you my answer? No. I haven't learned that Jesus is enough. I haven't. And, I, and it's hard for me to say that because it, it, it's just hard. You're a Christian and you're a pastor or you really love Jesus you really love him, but he's just not enough. And that's just my honest answer to you today. But can I tell you something else? I am learning to put Jesus at the center of my life, and I am learning what it means to be content by learning that Jesus is enough for me. I'm 24. <laughs> I have not learned it fully. Maybe I never will, but I know this. As I begin to practice putting Jesus at the center of my life, as I begin to practice learning that his grace is sufficient for me, I can tell you with all confidence that I feel truly satisfied. That there's nothing that can add to what he does for me in those moments where I realize that God, you are enough for me and you have never left me there's nothing more that can satisfy my heart than that. But it's a learning process, and I know it's a learning process for all of us. So I'm not going to leave you with, hey, go be content, because you'll try to do it. And I'll try to do it. Why don't we practice together what it looks like to rest in Jesus, to rest in his grace? How many of you are willing to do that with me this morning, to rest in God's grace for us and to Maybe if, as we leave this room today, we'd actually feel that, that contentment that Paul felt. That we wouldn't walk out critical, oh, God didn't give me what I needed in service today, or oh, that's not what I needed to hear. Maybe we just walk out and say, you know what, Jesus, you actually are enough, and I'm going to rest in that. 
one of the spiritual practices, we practiced silence and solitude a few weeks ago. Did anybody practice that at home? That is a beautiful, beautiful thing, and I pray that you guys continue to do that. I, I, I'm trying to do that every single day. I miss some days, but God has been good as I rest in his presence. Here's another thing that you can do. So I like to use silence and solitude as a practice where, where I, um, I practice that in the morning, um, and sometimes in the afternoon, depending on what my day looks like, I'll, I'll practice that to kind of pause and wait. But this is a practice that I use to kind of end my day. Um, and the worship team can come out. We're going to close here. Um, and and it's, it's called the examine, or, or in other words, the prayer of examine, which is the practice of rummaging through a day's experiences looking for God. Which kind of seems, kind of seems funny because you're kind of like looking through your day. And that's exactly what it is. The prayer of examine is like when you open your, your car, you lost something, and you're trying to find it because it's so important, right? Or uh, if you have a, a, a book bag or a purse and, and, you're, and you're rummaging through it to find your keys or you're at the toll booth and you're short a quarter. Like you're looking for that and you're rummaging through to find it, right? The examine is just like that. It's examining your day, trying to find God. And the point of this is, You are examining your day because likely there was something in your day that wasn't perfect. And likely there was something in your day that was actually good. And we want to rummage through our day. We want to find in our day the goodness and the grace of God that was present with us when we experienced those things. Honestly, we can get really, really sidetracked by good things and forget God. And we can get sidetracked by bad things and forget God too. And the truth of it all is that he's in the midst of it all. He's with us through it all. And the examine helps us at the end of our day to look back and say, God, where where were you today? If it was anything like my yesterday, I'm like, for real, where were you? I had a headache. I started getting a cold. I was kind of frustrated with my kids. My wife lost my debit card. We were at the the Fairfield or now the Frederick Fair. There's like hundreds of people around. And I was like, where are you, Lord? If your day was amazing yesterday, where was God? Where was his grace? And the exam, it helps us to find that. So would you stand with me as we close? And and what we're going to do is we're going to examine our yesterday. If you already did the exam and you sat, I mean, typically this takes me about 10 to 15 minutes at the end of my day. I try to do it when I'm not tired because I'll fall asleep. But I will sit with the Lord, kind of like I did with my solitude and silence, and I'll sit with God, and I'll think about my day, and I will think about the affections that I felt, the feelings that I felt, the emotions that I felt that day, and I will try to give name to them. So if I was to examine my day yesterday, I would just take a moment, and I'm literally running through my day. I'm rummaging through my day, top to bottom. And and some of the feelings that I felt were, you know, I'm frustrated, I'm tired, I'm dissatisfied the way that my day turned out, to be honest with you. And at the end of my day, I look through that and I, I honestly ask God, I say, where, where were you there? Where were you in my frustration, God? Where were you in, 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 the, in the points where I was disappointed? And I wait to hear the Lord or even show me as I picture my day to show me where he was. I did this for a situation in my life that happened when I was eight years old. I went all the way back because it was like a thorn that was tormenting me. I was struggling with this thing that happened um, in my past and I went back and I examined that day. I remember it like it was yesterday. It was a trauma in my life so I remember pictures like through the whole thing and I, I remember examining it and I was like, where were you Jesus? And at that moment, I was eight years old and I felt alone and I was on a beach. And I remember examining that day with my counselor and I felt like I could see Jesus like on the horizon in a boat, just watching over me. And it brought this grace that man, God, in the moment where I felt pain, you were there. But maybe you examined your day yesterday and it was great and you realize that the goodness of God was with you, and therefore you could, you, could, you could be joyous and happy. Would you do that with me really quickly? Just close your eyes and examine yesterday. Think of the feelings and the affections that you felt. Maybe you can ask yourself, why did I feel that? 
And then after you picture your day and you're thinking of some of the emotions you felt, maybe it was a whirlwind, maybe you were happy in the day and sad at night. And ask yourself this question, Lord, where are you? In my moments yesterday, where were you? Where were you, God, in my day? And as he begins to speak to you and show you, the best part of the examine is that whether you felt that God was close to you, he was far from you, we as as believers can't run from that place. We actually, in both scenarios, wherever you found Jesus, we actually press into his grace. And we hold on to the truth that God was there. He was present with you. And then just rest. And just know that no matter what you went through, God was there. He was watching over. He was there. He was providing your joy. He was making that laugh happen. God was there. He wasn't apart from you when you were struggling. He wasn't apart from you when that tragedy happened. He was there. And just rest in knowing that God's grace is sufficient. Jesus, what he's done for you is enough because when he died on the cross, he said that I would never leave you nor forsake you. He's an ever-present help in our time of need. And as we press into the place where God was, we can either do two things. We can repent or we could rejoice. We can repent and say, God, you were there and I didn't take hold of the joy that you had for me. I didn't take hold of that contentment and that rest, that satisfaction that I could have felt in that moment. God, I'm sorry and help me in the next moments that I feel that, in the coming times when I feel that, to to learn how to rest. And God, when I feel discontent, help me to rest that you're, no, and rest in the fact that your grace is enough. You are enough, Jesus. Or you just rejoice and you realize, man, God, (laughs) It wasn't due to my accomplishments that got me here in the place where I am. It's actually because of your grace. I deserve nothing, Lord, but you gave me everything and you rest in that moment. Thank you, Lord, that in every moment you are there. God, I, God, rebuke any lie in our minds that would say that you even left for a moment because you haven't. You've never left our side. Even in the most trauma and and, and horrible experiences, you were there. And it's not that you make it better because you don't make our life easy. That's not what your grace is. Your grace is that life is better because Jesus came and we can rely on the King of Kings who died and took our sin and is the Prince of Peace that we can lean on, God. And we thank you for that, Lord. We're not expecting you to fix our situations, Lord. Paul didn't expect that, God. We are pleading with you, God, that we would understand and tap in to the sufficient grace that your son Jesus provides. Lord, and we press into that this morning. We rest in that, God. We rejoice and we repent, God, and we grab hold of it in Jesus' name. God, teach us through these practices, Lord, that you are enough. Help us as we examine to recenter you at the center of our day so that we can experience the joy in a content life with you. Teach us the secret, God, of knowing your goodness knowing your grace, God, and give rest to our souls. Help us to be content in any and all circumstances. In Jesus' name, amen.